Mm -hmm. Nice. So for today's lecture, we will be speaking about object detection in general. And yeah, today and hopefully next week's lecture will both be about object detection. Uh, first week, we're going to be speaking about uh, the RCNN family. And then the second week, we will be speaking about YOLO, right? Uh, these are the two biggest families that you will find in the, in the object detection realm. Now we have a couple of few models that are using uh, visual attention or visual transformers. But I think just RCNNs and YOLOs are very good, very good introduction to the field of object detection. And if you'd like to see more, then we could definitely include something in the lab about uh, visual transformers, but it's not going to be that big because they're quite, quite hard to, to train fully for an object detection task. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a small disclaimer, one big problem or one major issue in the field of uh, object detection is the, uh, what is it called, evaluation. And uh, well, I did not think that we will have it in the lecture. So I will try to get it in your next week's lab, right? So how to evaluate basically an object detection model, especially uh, well, how to understand it, right? So now we have like a few more metrics. They're very similar to the computer revision metrics or the, uh, to the image classification metrics, but they, there is like a small a distinction in how we do the calculations. So uh, that definitely needs to be, uh, to be addressed. So either we will do it in the next, uh, next lecture or in the next lab. That's it, let's start then the, the, the lecture, right? So the, the, the goal of object detection is very, very different from that of an image classification task, right? So here, for example, in the image classification task, you take an image and all you have to do is say whether there is a class in that image. So class cat exists somewhere in the image. We don't know if it's in the center. We don't know if it's in the top right place. We don't know if it's in the bottom left corner. It's, it is somewhere in the image. We don't know where it is. But for the object detection desk, the goal is not just to find or to tell whether there is an object in the image, but also to find its most accurate location, right? So here, for example, we see the dog is in this region. We see the cats are in this region and we have basically two cats. This means that we have to predict both of them separately, right? So there are some models that would just look for the object cat and just put the rectangle over all the cat uh, instances, just one rectangle for all the cat instances. That's not what we will be doing. For the object detection, each object will be treated separately. And for each object, we will find his class and their location. Same also for, for example, this duck. Now, uh, I, I just want to like, ask like a simple question. It's not going to be like very complicated, but it's just a basic question. Do you guys think that uh, object detection is first of all supervised or unsupervised? Any thoughts? I think it's supervised. Is supervised. Next question would be, is it classification? Is it regression? Is it both? Or is it something completely else? Do we have a part in here that does classification? So far in what I've defined. Do you see something that resembles classification? Mm -hmm. There are no wrong answers. Please feel free to, to check it out. It's not a trick question. It looks like classification. It does have some classification. Now, the, the trick question is, 
does it contain also some regression, right? When we say the, the prediction of the bounding box or this location in the image, for example, location in the map, it's with those latitudes and longitudes and it's a number. Location inside an image, do you think will be a number also or what do you guys think will be? Will it be? So how do you think we should be approaching this problem? You have uh, you have variants when you have uh, some byte map, something like that, where where we say each pixel is classified like uh, something unknown or cat or dog or duck or you, if we use uh, if I correctly remember Yolo network, uh, we have only uh, four points of bounding box. Yes. So. As you said, there are two major techniques. You you were correct with the, the first one. Also, we will be seeing hopefully in the, after like three weeks. But what we will be seeing today is the idea of this bounding box, right? So a bounding box is just a rectangle. Anybody who has done, you know, third grade math will know that you can define a rectangle either with two points, right? Just with two points, you can define how the rectangle's shape will be. Or you can define it with one point, a height, and a width. And then, of course, from there, you can just continue filling the rectangle. So from what I just said, right, either two points, meaning the x and y coordinates for two locations, or the x and y coordinates plus width and height. This is how do we define a rectangle. Now, these are numbers, right? And we're trying to predict these numbers. So do you think that object detection also contains a small part of regression? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, it does. So just to summarize, the goal of the object detection technique is to first find a class for the object. So a class or a category, category plus a location for the class, which is let's say regression. So in this, in this, well, in this in this lecture, we will be combining both classification and regression in the same task, right? This is what object detection does. Now, let's see how can we do this, but or why do we need to do this first, right? So why would we need to do object detection in general? Of course, all of you already know this. So you can do applications, for example, like vehicle counting. So this could be something, for example, in your project, you just put a line on the image. This must be like hard coded for each individual image, right? And then you put a line with just a little bit of object detection and a little bit of object tracking. You can count how many, well, how many cars are going inside your city and how many cars are going outside of the city. And this information alone could help you, you know, organize a lot of things inside your city. So this would, uh, well, this would help you a little bit in organizing traffic and maybe some some other things in, in city organization tasks. Another task would be just basic facial detection and recognition. Your phone does this majority of, I don't know, China all live by this. So this is like something that is already very common and we see its applications. Other application might be like parking lot monitoring. So for example, you go to a parking lot, you don't have to just search around the parking lot for, for hours. You can just immediately go to the free spot and maybe someday we will be able to, through Google Maps, it tells you directly how many parking spots are available in each, in each garage, right? So now the idea of object detection, how can we do it in the most simple way possible, right? How can we do it in the most basic technique possible? Just to confirm, did everybody in here study the concept of 
convolutional neural networks. So did you all take the machine learning course about convolutional neural networks for image classification? I think yeah, we have say something to know about this. Okay, that's nice. So if you guys don't know a lot about CNNs, we, we could do like a quick revision, but I'm, I'm just going to assume that you, you know it very well. So the idea that we just said was, we're trying to do classification and regression at the same time. So why not simplify it and just do classification alone? So what we're going to do is, we will take a 2D CNN, which is your image classifier, just a basic image classifier, and just walk it across the image. We will be walking it across the image. Anytime that it finds the location, it will predict, or anytime it finds the object, it will predict that there is an object at this location. If it does not, it will predict zero, and we move to the next position. So what will happen is we will start at the top left, try to make a prediction at this region. There's nothing. We may we move here, nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing until we arrive actually on the object. So here we arrive, we find that there is this object inside the image that we just put inside the C2D CNN. The 2D CNN gives us a prediction coefficient of, I don't know, 0 0.9. So we are happy there is an object at this location. Can somebody already tell me what is the first problem you will notice about this, this technique, right? Let's list the problems together. Problem number one, why is this technique bad? You can deduce it from the object and this green rectangle. Does it look good? Does it look bad? Does it look, yeah, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, if the coordinate change, uh, uh, the confidence can increase. If the coordinates change, the confidence can increase. That's true. That that means basically if we put the uh, yeah, but that means if we put red like if we specify that our model will be sli sliding across this place, and if we put it across this place, the confidence will change. And if we duplicate it and we put it in both places, then it's gonna predict that same object a hundred times, right? If we put it in all the different variations, it's gonna predict the same object a hundred times. And if we put it just once randomly, it might cut the object in half and we don't have it, right? So forced shape of the uh, region of interest, let's call it region of interest, doesn't fit the object. Second is that it takes too long, right? It takes too long to go through an image. It's very slow to go through all to go through an image like this. Any other any other thoughts maybe? I think this is good so far. These are some two major issues in this one. So it's the speed and it doesn't give good shapes. For the speed problem, we could improve it a little bit. So what they do is they take the, the image, they make it as small as possible. So we make the image as small as possible. We build this pyramid of images, right? We've seen the concept of uh, image pyramids before, right? I think we did it in... Uh, you know, when we were doing the blurring and then downscaling, I forgot which lecture, but we did see it together, right? We saw that the image pyramiding is very interesting concept. It helps with a lot of techniques in computer vision field. And here we're also seeing it again, where we just take the image, make it as small as possible, and then do the search on the smallest version of the image. This will, you know, instead of passing, you know, through the big image, I don't know, one million times, we pass through this small image only like a hundred times. We just push it 
through the CNN like a hundred times, we find potential locations. And then what we do, we just zoom it out, zoom it back in. So let me just do some annotations. Yep. We just zoom back in here like this. And we now only search in this region that was activated in the small region, right? So we only search in this region and we found it in this place. So now that we found it in this place, we zoom back again and we don't need to, we don't need to search here. We don't need to search here. We don't need to search here. We only need to search in this region that was previously detected in a smaller place. We find it, we make the region even smaller or more you know, detailed, we go big, and then we go to all the original image. And this will help us you know, reduce a little bit the amount of calculations. Because if we did it, as I said, in the big image, let's say it's gonna be a thousand by a thousand, right? A thousand by a thousand, that's a lot of applications. But if we do it on the small image, it's gonna be like 10 by 10, just a hundred times, right? And then we go up, but we're only interested in this region. So we will also do it again at 10 by 10. And then we go up, we do it again, 10 by 10, go up 10 by 10 and go up at 10 by 10. So in, in total, it will be like five times 100 applications of the CNN versus 1000 times 1000. And you see that we have drastically reduced the amount of calculations we need to apply our algorithm. So that solves the first part. That solved, or this idea of the pyramid solves the, the first problem of the speed. How can we solve the second problem of not knowing where the object is? So as we said, when we force the shape of the rectangle, this is the rectangle that we're looking for. Only this shape is, is possible to search for. That leads to a model that doesn't know how to do its job correctly, right? So it leads to a model that doesn't work well. And this leads us to another technique. This technique is pretty simple. I'm not sure if we also seen it somewhere in the, uh, in, in, the, in the last lectures of the course, but I think we did see something similar to it. Selective search. Yeah, but I forgot. So selective search is, is a technique that basically allows us to solve the problem of not knowing where to search for. Selective search is just an algorithm. It's a very greedy algorithm. What it does is it looks at the image and it tries to combine the pixels together to form an object. So what happens is it looks at this image. Let's go back to the original image, right? It looks at this image. You see these pixels, they look similar. Pixels, same color, same intensities, let's say. And what it does is it will group all of these red pixels together in the same object and it would propose it. It would tell you maybe there is an object in this location that is red. It goes to these, to these objects, right? To these white pixels. All of these white pixels are connected to each other. Ah, yes, in connected component labeling, something like that. Yes, it's very similar to connected component labeling. So yeah, so it looks at these red pixels. It's, they're connected together, forms them into one potential object location. Looks at these white pixels, sees that they are all very similar, very connected to each other, merges them in the same potential object. And then it looks, I have a potential red object in here and a potential white object in here. What if they are both in the same object? So what it does, it proposes a third potential location that merges these two, merges these two into the same object. And it does this again and again and again and again, hundreds and thousands of times until it gives you all of these proposed regions. So you see, it proposes lots and lots of regions for you based on you know, similarities in pixel intensities, similarities in textures, similarities in, in, in any type of similarity that you can think of, it will try to find it. So selective search is just a simple algorithm that allows you to, uh, how can we say, uh, propose some potential object locations based on these major similarities in, uh, what is it called? In, uh, in pixel intensities or pixel or colors or whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about the selective search algorithm, let me just send you a good reference. Selective search. Okay. Yeah, color similarities, texture similarities, size similarities, and fill similarities. These are the types of similarities it looks for. And here you go. So it's a simple algorithm, as I said, it just basically recursively uh, groups pixels together or groups of pixels together based on similarities in their colors, in their textures, in the size, and in the fill of those uh, two regions. Now, the final thing that we will be covering before we go into the actual object detection architecture is the concept of intersection over union. So the concept of intersection over union is extremely important. Remember when I said that we cannot easily validate or evaluate an object detection model and all the metrics that we will be using are metrics that are very similar to the image classification task, right? So metrics that we will be doing for, uh, for estimating or evaluating the object detection are uh, concepts like average precision, average recall, uh, mean average precision, mean average recall, or you know different variations of that, right? So F1 score, right? So these concepts, you've already, you're already familiar with these names, right? F1 score, you've seen it in, image classification, precision and recall, you've also seen it in image classification, or even before image classification, you've seen it in just basic classification, right? The thing about object detection is it's very hard to use these metrics directly. And this is why we use a simple trick. And this trick involves intersection over union. So the intersection of a union is kind of the equivalent of what you might say is accuracy in classification, but for object detection, so when you have two objects or two bounding boxes, so this is the prediction bounding box. This is what I predicted. And this is the actual location of the object inside the image. They look close, right? They are similar to each other. So this prediction is not bad. It's not a bad prediction. Let's say it is like, I don't know, 98% accurate. Whereas if I have this kind of prediction, I predicted this, and the location is like here. This prediction is very bad, right? It's very far from each other. Now, how can we evaluate? This is this is something that we do like by by looking at them, right? So by eye, you can see that this one is almost ninety eight percent accurate. This one is like 0% accurate, it's horrible. But how can we build like a measure that gives us these numbers in an objective way? So it's not something that is based, based on, you know, what you see or what you think uh, these are looking like. And the, the metric that we'll be using is intersection over union. So intersection over union is just exactly as, it, as its name suggests. It calculates the intersections between the predicted location and the actual location. So if the intersection between them is high, that means they are very similar to each other, right? If there is a high intersection, then there is, they are very similar. Uh, we could stop there, right? We could stop at just this, just an intersection. Let's say intersection. If intersection is high, good, else, or intersection is low, then we say bad. But the problem is, how do you define high and how do you define low, right? If you have like very big objects here, you have a, like a gigantic rectangle and another gigantic rectangle, even though they're not very similar, but the intersection between them, just because they are big, the intersection between them is a very high amount, it's a very big number, but they are not actually good. So how can we fix this problem? We fix it by simply normalizing by the union. So we normalize the amount, the intersection value 
by the union value. We know that the union between two rectangles is always bigger than the intersection. Meaning intersection over union is always between zero and one. So it's, it's, a, it's a positive value, of course, and it is always normalized by the union, meaning it can never be bigger than one, and it is all, always bigger than zero. So you have now a number that is between zero and one, with zero being horrible, right? Zero means that the intersection is small, it's a horrible number, and one, so zero is horrible, and one means that your model has intersection is equal to the union. So when the intersection is equal to the union, this means that your, your prediction overlaps perfectly with the, uh, with the actual object. And this means you have a 100% accuracy for that prediction. Does, does the concept of intersection over union seem, seem logical for now or? Okay, I'll take that as yes. So for, for the intersection over union, we will be seeing it again very soon when we speak about, uh, as I said, mean average precision. The, for now, you're seeing it as just a way to validate the model, but later on, we will be seeing it as a way to convert basically the problem of object detection into a problem of, uh, of image classification purely. And that would lead us to you know, the, the, the step of just basically using uh, what is it called? Uh, just F1 score or accuracy even, or even like the precision and recall as a measure of performance of object detection. So we will be seeing that hopefully next week or some sometime in the future. Another, <laughs> I lied a little bit. This is the final thing that we will be speaking about before we go into an actual algorithm for object detection. This thing is called non-maximum suppression. So remember in the start of the lecture, we said that if we just apply the object detection or apply the, that sliding to the CNN uh, across different locations on the image, it might, as your friend said, it will give you different, your friend has said it like very perfectly. So it will give you like different prediction scores. So here it's like 0 0.7, here it is 0 0.6, for example. And the one in the middle is 0 0.99. So it will be giving you different uh, confidence scores just because the the location of your uh, your rectangle does not fully overlap the image. So the the image classifier was like maybe there is an object here, maybe there's not. And here you will end up with lots of bounding boxes for the same object. So we have this bounding box for this object, this bounding box for this object, and this bounding box. For the same object. We have lots of bounding boxes. So we have three, or let's say three bounding boxes for the same object. Two of them are useless. Can somebody tell me what is, what are the two that are useless? It's not a trick question. 0 0.7 and 0 0.6. The zero point the zero. maximum suppression will take the higher uh, probability object and like uh, remove other uh, non uh, other objects that doesn't have a higher uh, probability for the object itself. Perfect. You just perfectly summarize the concept of non maximum suppression. So as the name suggests, non maximum suppression. Anything that is not maximum, we will suppress it or we will delete it. So we will go to the maximum prediction, this 0 0.99. Anything that is not that maximum, we will try to suppress it. But let's say, for example, I have another object here. Let's say this is the cloud. I've predicted the cloud. And here it has 0 0.8, right? And it's just perfect. It's good. Just one object for it. It's a good object. We want to keep this object. Can you tell me yeah. how can we give the model or give the algorithm the ability to remove these two objects 
but not this one. So right. So if we said what we just said was we take the highest prediction, we keep only that and delete everything else. But now how can we improve this definition by saying we take only the highest uh, prediction, but locally, right? How can we say that? Let me give you a hint. Intersection over union. Uh huh. Like maybe if the uh, like detection boxes is intersection intersection between between each other, that means they are for uh, the same object. So from this group, we could eliminate and take the higher probability. And if okay. they are not intersected, that yeah. means they are belonging to a different object. Yes. So maybe that's how. I'm not sure. That's exactly how you have done it. A perfect job at explaining it. So as your friend suggested. What we will be doing is very simple. We go to this highest prediction box and we see intersection over union with everything else. So we can clearly see that this box with this box, intersection over union is zero. So they're not for the same object. We don't care about it. But for these other two, they are for the same object. And another clue that we have is that they share a high intersection over union with this box so what we will be doing is very simple we will be first let's let's put it in steps right one find highest prediction two calculate iou with everything else everything else three remove anything with high intersection over union four repeat steps one till three until you finish so this is the algorithm of non-maximum expression the actual algorithm has just a simple trick that is added so when i say find highest prediction in here what i will be doing is it will just delete it let's say delete it from predictions and put it in, let's say, a variable called final predictions, All right? So we just delete it from this predictions and we put it in final predictions. Why we do this? That, so that when we later on try to repeat the steps one to three, we're not just always stuck with the 0 0.99, but we can go to the 0 0.84 object. But that's all, that's that's the only difference, right? That's the, that's the only, uh, trick in this algorithm. So it's a very simple algorithm. The goal of the algorithm is to remove duplicated, duplicate uh, predictions for the same object. And we do that by, sorry, let's go back. We do that by simply following these steps. Select the highest proposal, put it into this, well, remove it from list B. So list B is basically the output of the model and add it to the final proposal list. Let's call it list D. Initially, it is empty. Now it contains the highest proposal. Compare the proposal with all the proposals using intersection over union. If intersection over union is greater than a certain threshold, remove the proposal from B. So we delete it or suppress that prediction. Again, take the proposal for the highest confidence in the remaining B and remove it from B, put it inside D. Once again, do this task and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat until B is empty and D contains only objects that don't have a high intersection over union between them. So there's no overlap between, major overlap between these objects. Now I'm gonna ask you a trick question. This is a little bit of a trick question. Please feel free to, you know, there are no wrong answers, so please feel free to answer it. But when it comes to the N, right? The threshold of intersection over union. So threshold, of intersection over union. I will give you two scenarios. First scenario, we are predicting, or we are counting, for example, the number of fish inside, let's say, the ocean. And the other scenario, which is a similar scenario, let's I will give you three scenarios. 
predicting the number of people in a busy street. You know that image that we see always of like New York, what is it called? Uh, Times Square Street, where it's full of people just walking. You can never, you cannot see the ground, right? It's a lot of people. And then we have another example, which is you are looking at, uh, I don't know, a medical image or medical scan for the heart, right? You're just looking for the heart, just one. So in, in this medical scan of the heart, you have just one object, which is the heart. <laughs> and there, there's zero possibility that there is another heart behind it, or there is a, an actual heart that is like very close to it, right? There's just one heart. We want that one heart. We want the location of that one heart. But in these two situations, right, we do have a high overlap between the object, right? It's not because the model makes a mistake and predicts the same object like five times. Now we actually do have five objects very close to each other. So these five objects do have a very high intersection over union. So what should you put the N to to build a good model for this one and a good model for this one? What should the N be? Like, let me give you, simplify it. One N should be 0 0.9, another N should be 0 0.1. Which one should get the N is equal to 0 0.1, let's say? By 0 0.1 means any small overlap, we remove it. The tiniest overlap, we get rid of it. Which one should get the 0 0.1? Mm -hmm. Maybe Aisa, you were you were very active earlier. I'm not sure. I guess none should take uh, zero point one. This one. No, uh, none of this object of this option. No, I, I know it's not, it's not 0 0.1. Let's say it's 0 0.5 or 0 0.3. So it's a small number, right? And this one is 0 0.7. Yeah, but like the case, in the case of medical scan, we need like it's a sensitive object and we need like a very accurate uh, result. So we should. No, no. Uh, this intersection over union threshold is for the non maximum suppression. So for the deletion of repeated objects. We want to delete anything that is repeated in this case, right? Anything repeated, we want to delete it. How can we do that? Okay. Mm. I'm not sure. So I'll give you this answer. So it's gonna be we setting the end to 0 0.1. What does that mean? Right. That means any overlap with the highest prediction will be removed. We only keep the highest prediction for the heart, because we only have one heart in that region, right? There's one heart in the image. We want to keep that one heart only. We don't want to have duplicates. But in this case, we do want to keep some duplicates, right? So some overlap, we want to keep it because it could be an actual real object in real life, right? So for this one, we put a high non, uh, N or high threshold for the overlap. So this is just to, to give you guys like a small a small heads up for the lecture or for the lab or for maybe for real life. Non-maximum expression is an algorithm that you will be seeing a lot and it's not a trained algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm as you can see in here, but it's hyperparameters can either break or make your, uh, your model, right? So your model's performances will be very highly dependent on this small, simple, simple basic threshold N and you will have to fine tune it for your object detection task in real life. So just keep that in mind. If you're building an actual uh, object detection model for real life, you will have to consider this uh, situation of fine tuning or hyperparameter optimizing the N. It's not a training algorithm. It's not, it's not part of the training, but it is part of the inference and it will give you very different results for for the accuracy or for the mean average precision we will see what that is later on 
that's it. Let me just go back and repeat what we have seen so far. So we've seen the basic idea of an object detection, basically sliding. We've seen why it's good, why it's bad. We said the speed. How can we improve that? And how can we improve the location predictions? We said with selective search, it gives us more customized locations. And then we send them through the uh, CNN. We said, we talked a little bit about intersection over union and how we can use it to you know, compare to bounding boxes. And we spoke about the non-maximum suppression. Now we are fully ready to look at our CNN. So the architecture we, has, we have been dis discussing so far it's not a hypothetical you know, architecture. It is the architecture of the first model that is called RCNN or regions with CNN features. This is the first object detection model out there that gave good performances. And how does it work? Three steps. Step number one, selective search. Selective search, as we said, proposes regions of interest. And always use this word, regions of interest. So step number one, propose, selective, uh, propose regions of interest using selective search. As you can see in the image, we will be proposing around 2,000 regions, which is, you know, it's a lot of regions, right? It's a lot, a lot of regions. Now, the second step would be resize each region into the same size. Why? For the step three, which is pass, let me see, pass the region or the warped region through the CNN. So the CNN will do the classification in here. Here, what we will be doing is the location, predicting the location based on you know a very simple algorithm that combines pixels together. We're here, what we'll be doing is we will change the region's sizes into the same size because we're using the same CNN. So what ends up happening is this big rectangle, we will convert it into, all of them will be converted into this. For example, this small region, also we will convert it into the same size like this. All of these different locations or regions of interest will be converted into the same size in this warped region uh, step, right? So it's just a simple resizing, right? Resizing an image. It's not, it's not learning. There's no learning here. It's just because the CNN requires a fixed size image as input. So we just convert anything that the uh, selective search gives us into the same size. And at the end, what we will be doing is the basic classification. Is there an airplane in this in this region? Is there a person in this region? Is there a TV monitor, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So this is the RCNN architecture. It's a very simple, simple algorithm, very basic technique. If you want to, you know, go down a little bit in the selective search algorithm and learn a little bit more about it, as we said, it takes generate initial subsegmentations. And we generate many candidate regions from there based on you know uh, similarities of uh, pixels or similarity in colors or similarities in texture. Use a greedy algorithm to recursively combine similar regions into larger ones and use the generated regions to produce the final candidates for region proposals. So these are the candidates of the region proposals. These are what we will be sending through the CNN to potentially find an object. So this is the RCNN architecture. It's a very simple architecture, very basic architecture, and it does not give very good results. And it's a very slow architecture. Now, let me give you a trick question. <laughs> so the trick question is going to be, what is the slowest part of RCNN? This question is going to be in your final quiz, and it's going to be like repeated like three in, in three questions. It's going to be in three questions of the final quiz. What is the slowest part of RCNN? What is the slowest part of fast RCNN? And what is the slowest part of faster RCNN? So this question, you must always ask yourselves about it. 
So first question, what is the slowest part of RCNN? So here, selective search, I can tell you selective search takes, let's say two to four seconds. And it's not the slowest part. What is the slowest part? Maybe computing CNN features. Computing CNN features, why? Right, because one image through CNN is not that big. It's just like, let's say one second, let's say. You are correct, but why? First of all, we have uh, 2,000 of uh, region proposals. Nice. And for each of it, we need to compute CNN features. Exactly. So this is the most time consuming step in the RCNN architecture, which is the 2,000 times the one second. And that ends up being, you know, I don't know, five minutes or four minutes or something like that. I'm not good with math, but it's, it's a lot. It's a very, very, very big, big problem. And even if we make this smaller, so let's say we are using a GPU and it's a, each image goes through the, uh, the, the, the CNN much faster, it's still a lot, right? It's still 2000 image classification tasks. That's a lot. We cannot do that. So this is the major problem with RCNN. So as we said, training time is crazy. 2,000 classifications per image. You know, each image takes 2,000 classifications in the training time. So training time is like, I don't know, it's a lot, right? Inference time is horrible. So it's around 47 seconds. Again, for the same reason, right? These 2,000 classifications per image. And selective search is not data set specific. So selective search, as we just discussed, it's an algorithm that is quite basic. It looks, oh, similar colors, let's group them together. That's all it says. Similar colors, I will group them together. They are overlapping, I will group them together. All, all of these are like techniques that the uh, selective search algorithm will be using and they're not very smart, right? So it's the same algorithm for all the data sets and uh, one thing that we, we have seen, hopefully, over the last uh, few weeks of this course is that algorithms, algorithms that don't have any learning tend to be very, very bad, right? So this hypothesis might work a little bit for some, for some data sets, but will be very, very bad for other data sets, like medical image data sets, right? Where Pixel intensities might be very similar because, I don't know, you're looking at the heart and then behind the heart, there's the liver or something like that. I'm not a good doctor, but I'm supposing that the pixels between, you know, different uh, objects in the, in the human body will be kind of similar, right? The heart, the liver, uh, the, anything else would have the similar pixel intensities. And this selective search algorithm is just going to merge everything together and you're not going to have anything useful. So selective search is not data set specific and it does not have any learning, meaning it's not a good idea to use it. We will soon see how to fix this problem. But for now, as you just said, the major, major issue is the time. It's too slow. This is the major issue. Speed. So for now, what we have seen is basic object detection, what it is, how we can do it. We spoke a little bit about intersection over union and how to use non-maximum suppression to improve a little bit your results of your model. And we spoke about the RCNN, which is the first architecture for, uh, for object detection that we speak about. Let's take a five minutes break and then we come back later and we discuss fast RCNN and the faster RCNN architectures. And as you, the name suggests, right, they are faster than RCNN. Do you have any questions so far, or we, we take the break and come back? Maybe you could take the break. Let, let's take the break and see you back in, uh, right now it's 09, right? So it's 9 a.m. Yeah, let's just see you back at 10, right? Okay. See you.
<laughs> yep. So, can you guys hear me? Can you see the lecture? Everything good? Yes, everything good. Recording continues too. Nice. So as we said, we have spoken a little bit about object detection, what it is and how we can do it, how it relates to concepts like uh, regression and how it relates to concepts like uh, classification. We spoke a little bit about intersection over union and non-maximum expression. And now we spoke also about RCNN and the problems of RCNN, why it is very slow. And the trick was 2000 images passing through the CNN. Fast RCNN solves exactly that problem. The solution is, instead of passing 2,000 images through the CNN, you pass one image through the CNN. So let's see how we do that. <laughs> so as we said, the solution is, it's very simple. Instead of 2,000 images go through CNN, one image. It goes through CNN. So it sounds like a simple idea, but it's definitely not easy to do, right? Because well, we have like 2000 images. How can we convert those into one single image? And the idea or the trick is here. What you will be doing is let's put it in multiple steps. First step, pass the image, all the image through the CNN, the whole image, completely, not regions, not proposals, not uh, hypothetical or candidate locations, but the whole image. Step number two, apply selective search on the input image, right? This one gives you a feature map, convolutional feature map, right? The output of a convolutional neural network or convolutional layer is a convolutional feature map. I hope that's that's a, that's an easy easy term. Convolutional feature map is just basically the output, right? It's just the output of the CNN. Selective search on the input image gives you two thousand potential locations. We will be calling them, as we said, regions of interest, potential regions of interest or candidate regions of interest let's put can't here candidate regions of interest previously what we were doing is we pass each one of these candidates through the cnn but now we're doing something different now what we're going to do is three map or directly map the candidate location into the cfm or the convolutional feature map so instead of calculating a convolutional feature map for each uh, region of interest, we will be calculating a big convolutional feature map. And each region of interest, we will just do the mapping to it. So this location, for example, corresponds with this location in the convolutional feature map. So we will take this from the output of our big image and we put it. If, for example, I was working on an object here, Let's say I was working on an object in this location. Let me use a different color. Let's say I'm working on an object in this location. Its corresponding feature map will be here. This is the corresponding feature map. And then we send it through the classifier. So is this idea so far intuitive? Does this idea make sense, right? It's a simple idea. the trick of fast RCNN. Instead of passing 2000 images through the CNN, you pass only one. And how do we do this trick? By reversing the order of selective search and the CNN pass. First, we go through the CNN with the full image. We get the output of the CNN. And then we select the images from the input, uh, select the, so they use selective search to propose 2000 regions and do the mapping from uh, the ROI location inside the input image into the ROI location inside the CFM. How we do this mapping, we will see it in the next slide. Very basically, what ends up happening is, uh, I'm sure you have already done this in the 
class of Professor Khan, but let's just repeat it. If you have here an input image, big input image, right? It's an HD image. And you put it through a convolutional layer, just one convolutional layer. The output is going to be a slightly smaller image. This is too small, but it's a slightly smaller. Now imagine you do this task five times and you apply also a concept called as max pooling. Max pooling reduces the size drastically of the image. So if you apply these convolutional layers multiple times with a little bit of max pooling, what you end up with is an output image that is much, much smaller than your input image. How much smaller? Let's say it's 20, 32 times smaller. Let's say it's 32 times smaller or 16 times smaller. It's up to you. So saying that it is 32 times smaller, we keep this ratio, the 32 size smaller, we keep it. Now, if I tell you that there is an object in this location, its coordinates are, what is it? What is this? Uh, 300, no, this one, this is the coordinates. 340 and 450. This is the location that I propose to you. Me is selective search. So selective search proposed this location for a potential object. What you will be doing is take this number, divide it by 32. So this number by 32, this number by 32, and you get the location inside the convolutional feature map. How much, how can you get the uh, width and height? Exactly the same way. You take the width and height, these are the width and heights, divide them by this ratio, and you get the new width and height of your object. Does that make sense? I'll take that as a yes, right? <laughs> so going back to this architecture of FASTAR CNN, as we said, we will take the whole image, pass it through the CNN once, get a convolutional feature map. And then for each region of interest proposal, we will do the mapping. The mapping is a very simple technique. It's just a simple division. You have like big image, you divide, divide it by the ratio of the small image. So you divide, for example, whatever number that selective search gives you, divide it by 32 or by 16 or whatever, or whatever ratio you have. And that would lead, what that would give you, a uh, calculation of the location or potential location of your region of interest inside the convolutional feature map. I am sure the rest is already done by Professor Khan. So what, what you get is when you have a convolutional feature map, send it directly through the fully connected layers, and you can now do the classification, right? So any typical CNN can is built or based on three types of layers. First two, in the encoder, we have something called as convolutional layers plus max pooling. This is the encoder. This is the CNN layer, the CNN part of CNN. This is the convolutional part of the CNN. The final part will be just basic multi-layer perceptrons. Other, word, other people say it fully connected layers. You can call it however you want. You can call it the linear layers. Other people call it fully connected. As I said, it's, it's up to you. You can call it however you want, but multi-layer perceptron anything you want to call it, but this is the layers that are responsible for the classification. These are the layers that are responsible for the classification. So what ends up happening is you take the output of this, send it through the fully connected layers and you do the classification. One thing is missing here. And that one thing in order to see it, we must go back first to the RCNN. So remember in RCNN, we said it gives you different regions. Selective search gives you different sizes. And what we do is we just convert the size into everything we convert it into the same size, put it through the CNN, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what RCNN does. Here in this location, we don't have this concept. We can't find a place where we can do the resizing, right? So here, since we apply well, since we basically send the, the whole image through the CNN, 
we cannot do resizing before CNN. So the resizing is not going to happen before the CNN. What are the other options? <laughs> it's not going to happen during the CNN. So it's not, not happening before or during. What is the only other option that, are, that remains for resizing the site? After. after the CNN. So after the CNN, we apply resizing. Very nice. And we're not going to be calling it resizing. We're going to be a little bit fancy and we give it like a, another name that is called region of interest pooling. Remember the concept of max pooling? I hope so. So max pooling takes like a, an input image and it spits out a smaller version of that image uh, based on the maximum values. So for example, if in, in a region you have a pixel values four, five, six, seven, it will take pixel value seven and just put it in the corresponding output, in the smaller output. So that's it. It will just take the maximum value in it locally in each region and then shrinks the size of the image by four, let's say, right? ROI pooling does something very similar, but instead of shrinking, it just resizes. So it could upsize, it could make the Im output image bigger, or it could make it smaller. ROI pooling has a fixed, fixed output size. So ROI pooling is a technique that has a completely fixed output size, and it allows you to basically uh, convert any feature map in here, any uh, ROI projection of the feature maps into the feature maps into always the same size. You see this? This is the size of it. It was previously big. Now it's small. If I take a small part of the image here, prediction or candidate ROI in here, I do the ROI projection. It's also a very small part of the convolutional feature map. ROI pooling will make it bigger. It will make those pixels even bigger than they are in real life, just because you know the fully connected layers always expect a fixed size input. So these are the problem. <laughs> the fully connected layers are the problem that we're facing here. So this is it. This is this is basically all that you need to know about uh, uh, about uh, fast RCNN. I'm not sure if we should go into more deep depth about ROI pooling, but uh, let's finish the lecture first. And if we still have some time, we will spend a lot more time explaining what ROI pooling does. And we will just, just do a simple handwritten example and you will immediately understand it very well. So it's a very simple concept, right? So as we said, first you take ROI proposals, you do the ROI projection into the feature map. It's a simple division. There's no calculation happening here. And then you do the ROI pooling, which just converts the sides into the same thing, put it through the fully connected layers. Fully connected layers are pretty fast, right? They're not, they're not, they're not horrible in times of like in terms of uh, time complexity. And here we can see the gain, right? So ignore this SPP net. It's a it's an it's an architecture that we will not be talking about, but focus more about. RCNN and fast RCNN. So the training time for RCNN was 84 hours, whereas the training time for fast RCNN is 8.75. So it's a much smaller time. So it's 10 times smaller in terms of training. Now let's see in terms of test or inference time, and here I'm going to ask you another question that is extremely, extremely tricky, but whoever gets the answer correctly will get a bonus point. So focus. So the inference time in total for fast for RCNN is 49 seconds. And the inference time in total for uh, fast RCNN is 2.3 seconds. We see in here that the, the big problem here was, so this the blue one is including region proposals, meaning including selective search, whereas the red is excluding selective search. And we can see in RCNN, the problem was clearly 
this part, the big red part, the red part was taking too much time. Whereas this fixed time, which is the time for uh, region proposals or the time for selective search was just two seconds. We didn't care about it. No need to simplify that further. But when it comes to fast RCNN, can you tell me what is the part that takes the too much time? Blue one, including the input. Including, right? So including is equal to 2.3, including selective search, it's equal to 2.3. Excluding it is selective search, it is equal to 0 0.3. Can somebody tell me selective search? How much time does it take? Two. Two seconds. Two seconds. Previously, two seconds in 49 was not a problem, right? It was slow, but it was not the problem of RCNN. RCNN had much bigger issues than selective search. But now fast RCNN does not have much bigger issues than, than selective search. So what is the slowest part of fast RCNN? Selective search. Selective search. Who said that? Usama. Um, Usama. Thank you, Usama. You will you will get a bonus point. Uh, just just text me later, and we will discuss how to get it. So now the problem of fast RCNN is selective search. We have to solve it, right? Any more improvements on the red side will be useless if our blue side contains this uh, fixed two second. Uh, threshold that we're always adding into our inference, right? And that leads us to faster RCNN. So before I go to faster RCNN, just a small recap. We have RCNN, problem, RCNN, its problem is 2000 images go through CNN, fast RCNN has one problem, which is selective search, too slow. This is the reasons why they are too slow. Each one of them has a reason. This one, this was the reason. We fixed it in fast RCNN. Selective search has the problem in fast RCNN. So faster RCNN solves exactly selective search issue. Now the solving is gonna be a little bit tricky. So it will require a little bit of, you know, thinking, <laughs> but it's gonna be also a very logical solution. Just so that I know how much time do we still have? And we have 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay. So it's not gonna be enough for us to finish the faster RCNN architecture fully but at least it's gonna be a step forward. So first of all, here you can see that it contains fast RCNN network. So it did not change the fast RCNN network. The change only happened where? In the first part. So here we have the fast RCNN, easy. We know fast RCNN, we have seen it, understand its architecture. Here we have the region proposal step. Previously, region proposal step was, in, in fast RCNN, previously it was selective search. Now it is called region proposal network, right? A region proposal network. So it's a neural network that does exactly what the, the name does, what the name suggests it does, it proposes, regions for the next fast RCNN architecture. How does it do that? Remember our idea, like in the start of the course, that basic, very stupid idea of passing a CNN through the image, right? Sliding the CNN through the image. This was the most basic, direct, stupid idea for object detection, right? What if I tell you it's not that bad, actually? It's actually quite nice if we do a simple trick 
And this trick is very similar to what we did with fast RCNN also. So remember with fast RCNN, what we did is we take the image, pass it once through the CNN, and we get a much smaller What is the name here? Convolutional feature map. Uh, this is the image. Our idea of sliding classifier was bad because it was very slow and it takes like a, a part of the image, like it sends an image through the CNN every time. How can we solve this problem from what we learned earlier? Same thing. We pass the image once, get a convolutional feature map and do the search on the convolutional feature map, right? So on, on this convolutional feature map, we will be going with multiple classifiers or what one classifier. We put it here and then we put it, let me, let me use this one. Yep. So we will take a classifier, you know, basic classifier, just multi-layer perceptrons, classification loss, basic, just one layer or two layers, very simple, right? And what we do is we apply it here and then we apply it here, and then we apply it here, and then 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 here, and everywhere inside the image. This is not time consuming because fully connected layers are very fast and easily parallelizable. <laughs> they're not sequential, so they're very parallelizable. This means that you can apply uh, this, you know, this classifier, the, the sliding classifier, you can apply it at the same time on all the image very, very fast. If you have a good GPU, you can do it in no time. So remember, as we said, the sliding classifier idea was bad. How can we fix it? First, we take the image, pass it through a CNN, get the convolutional feature map, and search inside the convolutional feature map instead of searching inside the image. And this is what the region proposals do. So region proposals, they go through a CNN backbone. Don't look at the name VGG. I'm not sure if Professor Khan already gave you like the initialization into architectures of CNNs, but if not, we will we will see them in the future. It's just a CNN, just a, just a CNN. No, no, nothing big deal, no big deal. It gives you this black box, which is the convolutional feature map, right? It's the output. As you can see, it's much smaller. Here it was 60, uh, 1000. Now it is 60 pixels. And here it is five, 600 pixels in, in, in height. Now it is only 40 pixels in height. So it's so much a smaller image. Now you can easily slide through it with a classifier. You will notice it has a lot more channels. So can somebody tell me how many channels in this input image do we have? One channel. Three. Three channels. Three channels. RGB. RGB. Right, exactly. Thanks, Sayyid. So it's RGB, it's, uh, what is it called? It's uh, red, green, and blue, right? These are the channels that you have in the input image. The convolutional feature map by design or the convolution architecture by design always increases the number of channels from one layer to the next. And this allows you to basically learn more deeper or more abstract or more higher level representations of uh, of your uh, of your input image, but it's it's just a trick basically to allow us in general convolutional feature maps or in general uh, image classification. This is something that we always do. Uh, we might, if we have like some time next lecture, we will speak a little bit about the architectures of CNNs. But for now, as you can see, we have a much smaller image in size. It's very deep, meaning we will be using like a very long. <laughs> A neural network as an input, but it's okay. It's, as we said, it's highly parallelizable, so it's not a computation that we are afraid of. And we will be applying it on every single pixel in here or any every single image in here. And any place that we find a potential object in or a, you know, it's a classification task, right? Either there is an object or there's no object. So anytime we find an object, we propose it and we send it here to the fast RCNN. I'll try to go a little bit faster and just to show you guys an example of these things, what these things are. All right, so this is the fast start of CNN. And these are the region proposal network. It's a little bit more zoomed in. As we said, you go through the CNN, gives you a convolutional feature map. Convolutional feature map, we apply two types of 
layers on top of that. So the first one are a, a convolutional three by three filter. And then the second one is a one by one filter. Next lecture, I promise you, we will speak about why do we do a three by three filter filter followed by a one by one filter. And especially how do we remove, reduce this number of channels from 512 to 18? And why do we do that? The how is easy. The why is more, is more delicate. And why is this 18 and 36? All of these numbers, we will speak about them in much more detail, hopefully next lecture. But just so that you go to the lab in more details uh, with enough details uh, in bag, right? So that you know a little bit about the faster RCNN. What we will be doing is at every single step, we will try to predict whether there is an object or there is no object. And we will try to predict the location of that object. So here at this position, we will try to find or fine tune the boxes, the bounding box. Maybe it's like more rectangle. Maybe it's more, uh, it's longer. Maybe it's height, uh, it's bigger. So here we will try to make the, the bounding box different. We will try to extend it, make it smaller. It's up to what this, this, this is the uh, part of the network that will fix the shape of the object. And this is the part of the network that will decide whether there is even an object or there is no object, right? So this is the classification. It has only two uh, uh, options. There is an object, there is no object. It does not do object classification in detail. So it does not do the actual object classification. It just proposes potential reasons. And again, we're not gonna be applying at each position. You see this position A, we're not gonna be applying just one classifier. We will be applying nine. Why nine? A nine is a very good number, right? It's three by three. First three is for the size, small, medium, large. So it allows us to search for small objects, medium objects, and large objects. And the other three is for the following. Rectangle or not square, a horizontal rectangle, vertical rectangle. So three by three, we have all the combinations. Small rectangle, small, small rectangle, small square, small other rectangle, medium and large for all of these combinations. And we will be applying all of these types of anchors, we call them, or classifiers, if you want to call them like that. And we will try to find potential locations of the objects. As I said, we will go a little bit more into details about all of these concepts, hopefully in the next lecture. But I think at least for now, you have a good understanding of the RCNN family that you can go to, to hopefully the lab and discuss this with Betul a little bit in more detail. Do you have any questions so far? Oh, good. So uh, I hope you guys have like a beautiful day and uh, hopefully next next week we will discuss again a little bit about faster RCNN and uh, we will be speaking about YOLO. It's going to be very easy now that you know faster RCNN. So knowing, understanding the, the new versions of YOLO, be it YOLO v3, YOLO v4, up to YOLO v8, is going to be an easy task for you to do. So thanks a lot for attending and see you next week. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.